Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In terms of the uh, the second, um, the first question, which is about apostasy, I think the Islam, like all the pre-modern religions, um, have has apostasy laws. That aspect of the Sharia has been long gone, and it's like other religions. Muslims, with the exception of uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and I believe Iran has a moratorium right now, but they were applying. And there's been arguments to apply it in Afghanistan. Th there are still apostasy laws that are on the books. If you look at the early period of Islam, and there's arguments from Baha Jabr al-Wani, actually a great Usuli scholar that I think is well known in Oman, wrote a book about arguing that the apostasy laws are really treason, treasonous laws and shouldn't be seen as that. And that's, that's one argument. There's no doubt if you look at the history of Islam, it was very rare that apostasy laws were ever applied. I'll give you one good example. Abu Anad Ma'arri, who is a very well-known poet and a very famous uh, anti-Muslim writer. I mean, he really didn't like Islam. He lived to the ripe old age of almost 90 in Aleppo under Muslims. Now, I think the Arabs probably left him because he was such a good poet. And they figured, you know, even though he has zendaka, anybody that can write poetry like that should be left alone. That's possible. But he's noted for uh, many, many things. One of them, he talked about the Qur'an, uh, the injunction about cutting off the hand of a thief. And he said, يَدٌ بِخَمْسِ مَئِينَ عَسْجِدٍ مَا بَالُهَا قُطِعَتْ فِي رُبْعِ دِنَارِ You know, a, a hand that you have to pay 500 dinars if you cut somebody else's hand off by accident. He said, what's up with cutting it off for a quarter of a, a, a dinar? And so Qadi Abdul Wahab, the famous Maliki scholar from Iraq said, the, the, uh, the dignity of trustworthiness of that hand made it a valuable hand. But when it became a treacherous hand, it lost its value. My point about that is that that bait is kufr by Muslim scholars. I mean, and yet. He was writing those lines in Aleppo, in a, a place that was ruled by Muslims. Many examples, if you look in the history of Islam, very rarely were apostasy laws applied. I'll give you another example. In Qurtaba, there's a famous, the martyrs of Qurtaba, that some Christians might know this story. There was a group of Christians who were so troubled by the fact that so many Christians in Spain were becoming Muslim, they started going into the masjids and cursing the Prophet ﷺ publicly so that the Muslims would turn on them. They actually wanted martyrdom so that they could revive the uh, Christian spirit in Spain. The Caliph actually ordered these people to be like, he didn't want it to happen. He was so bothered by it because one, he understood what their strategy was, but two, uh, because he just didn't want that to be taking place. And so there's a whole interesting history of what was going on then. I would argue that in the West, we are in a post-Christian period. It's very difficult for Western people to understand when religion is central to your life and your experience. Um, how important that is. And religion, the, one of the most powerful claims of Abrahamic religions is this world is finite, it's only a very short period, but the next world is infinite. And when you're looking at the finite world in relation to the infinite world, the infinite world has far more relevance to anybody who takes religion seriously. And so when somebody leaves the religion, it's an incredible calamity. Anybody that takes Christianity serious understands this at all because they're putting the soul into perdition. In Holland, the Dutch people are in a very post-Christian environment. Very few Dutch people, even though they were once very, very... They've always had a history of tolerance until very recently with the Islamic thing. I mean, well, maybe not always, but they're noted for their tolerance. And... Um, and I think they still are a tolerant people. They've tolerated uh, heroin addiction and prostitution and a lot of other things. 
um, that aren't so positive, but they are a tolerant people. And the, uh, but religion is not taken seriously. And that's why it's very hard for a lot of Europeans to relate to the seriousness by which Muslims take their faith. And so if somebody leaves the faith in the family, it's as if they died. I have a Jewish uh, friend who converted to Islam that Imam Zaid knows very well. Mustafa Chetnev. He's from uh, New Mexico uh, and he lives there. He's a very brilliant um, man who embraced Islam. His parents, who were Orthodox Jews, had a funeral after he converted to Islam. They literally buried the coffin and told everybody that their son had died. Because to them it was as if he had died. He told me though that his mother used to send cookies at Hanukkah time. See, mothers can't. You know the famous story of the Christians tell about Jesus not letting all the people that didn't believe in him into paradise and then when he went into the garden, he found all the people he had kicked out. And he said, what was going on? And it was, they said it was Mary. She was letting them in the back door. Because women have more compassion. You know, so that was the, you know, that was the, um, you know, the idea of giving a funeral was as if they had died. And I think a lot, for a lot of Muslims, that is a, a real... Uh, it's a great calamity and tragedy. But in terms of Ridda, uh, apostasy laws, we tell people, I, I know people in America whose uh, children have left Islam. It happens. Um, we certainly, I encourage people to maintain their relationships with them because one, it's a very confusing time we're living in. The Prophet ﷺ said, يُصْبِحُ الْحَلِيمُ حَيْرَانًا That even intelligent people will, will become confused towards the end of time. And we know also that the atheists win in the end. Because the Prophet said that the end of time won't come until there's no one left calling on God in the world. So Dawkins wins in this world. And, and that's, we believe that. So, uh, you know, apostasy is, you know, it's one of the pre-modern uh, rulings that is definitely in Islam. Abu Hanifa did not consider women uh, if a woman apostated, there was no capital offense for a woman in the Hanafi Madhab because he did not, one, the hadith, man badra dinuhu faqturuhu, was ahad, it's ahad hadith, whereas the hadith prohibiting killing women and children is mutawata. It's a factual hadith that nobody can deny. The Prophet said, do not naha Rasulullah an qatr al nisai wal awlad. It's a mutawata hadith. And so even in the Maliki Madhab, it's prohibited to, to kill women. But if they fight you, you can kill them. But in the Maliki books, they say, if on the battlefield a woman comes towards you, you should avoid her and, not, and try to get away from her so that you don't have to kill her. Because the prohibition was so strong about protecting women and children. Imam al nahai did not uh, believe in capital offense for... Um, for apostasy. So there are ulama from the Salaf period that were from the uh, students of the Sahaba that did not uh, uh, confer with that. He preferred ta'zir or habs, some type of um, some type of discipline that would uh, get them back into the uh, deen. So, but I, I know that uh, there, there are many secular people in now in the Muslim world that don't really believe in Islam, but the idea of openly, uh, you know, declaring that is is still not done in most countries. Although there are open secularists in many Muslim countries today, there are Baptists and people that don't believe in Islam. And um, I mean, in the end, I think that freedom of conscience is uh, is something that the Prophet ﷺ honored. And he was certainly very aware of persecution. And we read that verse in the Quran that Al Fitnatu Akbaru min al Qatri, Al Fitnatu Ashidu min al Qatri. Persecution is worse than killing. You know, uh, the, the Quran very clearly states you can't make people believe. You know. Do you think you can force people into being believers? You can't. It only 
creates hypocrites. So 